just kind of discuss it. Like one of the ways that protein aggregates impact the health of the cells is through the mitochondria. So how how do the mitochondria change with age? And kind of what are the driving factors right. that push them? So yeah, so again, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, matter. I mean, in the sense that mitochondria are very complex and dynamic organisms and, and, uh, and they, let's say what happens normally, the way that they maintain homeostasis is that they are constantly generated and replaced essentially um, depending on the uh, stimuli and the uh, metabolic inputs that they get uh, and the needs of the cells. So, and again, as I mentioned also before, the way to maintain mitochondrial homeostasis is either through generating new mitochondria, so mitochondrial bio, uh, bio, biogenesis, or mitophagy in order to clear damaged mitochondria. And also mitochondrial dynamics are very important for this because essentially mitochondria are, can be either fragmented and become like more isolated and so on. And this is when they, for instance, can be taken up if they are damaged uh, to, to be uh, degraded by mitophagy, or they can be uh, forming very extensive networks to actually improve or become more efficient in terms of metabolic function. So this normally works uh, very well and it's very dynamic and uh, they can adapt very quickly in a youthful or healthy status. Mm -hmm. However, over time what happens is that due to the decline also or in the other uh, pathways that they take care of things like mitochondrial clearance, uh, loss of, you know, let's say autophagy or other pathways that should be taken care of reducing the damaged mitochondria and the fact that also mitochondria function in terms of generation of the energy. So the balance between the different complexes within the mitochondria that would generate ATP becomes altered due to, again, um, uh, alteration of protein synthesis, uh, reduced um, uh, mitochondria biogenesis and so on. Then the mitochondria start becoming also, let's say, less function in terms of generating energy, they may generate perhaps more uh, ROS and more oxidative mm -hmm. stress, and they tend to accumulate also, so because they cannot be removed any more efficiently through mitophagy during aging due to the decline in this process. And so what happens is that you tend to accumulate dysfunctional mitochondria, which then in turn, you know, they can start generating damage also within the cells, right? Because if right. you have essentially more oxidative stress and uh, let's say less uh, energy generation and the inability to remove these mitochondria essentially there would be uh there, yeah that's when essentially problems start occurring because then you get an influence on the other all marks as well so these all marks are all connected right so mm -hmm. that's where it becomes important to maintain homeostasis yeah. so how do we how do we encourage mitophagy so uh yeah i mean from, there are several genetic uh, pathways that uh, modulate and mi mitophagy. I mean, in terms of, you know, essentially that can be also stimulated through, let's say, nutrient sensing. I mean, uh, there is uh, an, the involvement, for instance, of phosphorylation processes that sense and detect damaged mitochondria, and then they stimulate the ubiquitin proteasome system essentially uh, to remove this, uh, this. So they tag the damaged mitochondria and then they recruit the ubiquitin proteasome system in order to uh, get rid of them. Pharmacologically speaking, there is, I would say, people are actively looking to mm. ways to specifically target mitophagy, but I would say at the moment, pr perhaps one of the molecules that I think it's very well known also in the supplement space and so on is urolithin A. Mm -hmm. So that one, it's a natural molecule. It's grass uh, recognized as generally uh, um, uh, safe. Uh, it's been already used in humans uh, a lot by, um, essentially it's been discovered uh, in my ex lab at EPFL with the, in the OVEX lab and is now being used uh, currently in, um, um, by uh, companies to do clinical trials. And that one seems to very strongly promote mitophagy in several tissues and in particular seems to work pretty well for brain and muscle. So uh, preclinically speaking, uh, with some initial evidence now going for muscle aging in humans. So that one seems Right. the most promising at the moment yeah okay uh, okay so with our mitochondria not behaving very well because they're being stressed uh if it's in muscle so then we get like sarcopenia right so if we start off what is what is the root cause of sarcopenia and actually I thought that sarcopenia was essentially, like if you're sedentary and you get old, you will eventually get sarcopenia because your muscles just waste because you're sedentary. Right. But is there some 
is there some external cause? Is there some something else that would force that, that would make sarcopenia happen? Yeah. So so that's so sarcopenia. Yeah. So it's it's a bit of a complex answer in the sense yeah. there are multiple uh, possibilities in the sense that. Yes, in theory, you know, we would all think, oh, yeah, if I don't exercise at all or if I'm too sedentary, I would normally develop sarcopenia. But it's the same as dementia, right? So if you think you would never exercise, you know, your, your brain in uh, like thinking or doing being busy with tasks and so on, uh, eventually you would think like, oh, yeah, if, you know, everyone should develop dementia. But there are, in fact, yeah, people that still are resilient to that. And essentially, you have to think of sarcopenia as a sort of continuum from the decline of muscle function as we age. So sarcopenia is not just, let's say, losing muscle mass, it's also losing strength and the uh, ability to do daily movements that are impacting your quality of life. So essentially, there are these three, as I mentioned, three clinical readouts, so grip strength, lean mass, and gait speed, which are indicators collectively uh, of sarcopenia. So if they mm -hmm. go below certain thresholds, and these are uh, guidelines that have been established worldwide by different consortia of clinical experts, that's where you are below a certain threshold, you're considered sarcopenic, right? So it's really a continuum from your muscle aging up to a point that you are really physically impaired in your daily life. But that means that essentially sarcopenia, it's a worsening, or if you want, or it's a, a um, impairing condition from the muscle aging per se. So it's still associated with muscle aging. And mm -hmm. there are several, uh, let's say, factors. So in that sense, the same hallmarks of aging or muscle aging are also important for sarcopenia. And as I mentioned, NAD is significantly reduced in uh, biopsies from sarcopenic individuals. Mitochondrial dysfunction uh, is occurring during sarcopenia, even compared to muscle aging. So you may get a decline of these metabolites or, or these pathways in muscle aging, but in sarcopenia, it's even more pronounced. Mm. So you really get like a significant decline in these functions. And that's some of the things that probably contribute to the uh, worsening of the condition. Right. Clinically, I, I guess it's, but you also see like these protein aggregates building up. Right. Do, do they build up more in sarcopenia or we don't know? Um, we don't know. I mean, I would say the simple answer, we don't know yet because we I've seen them in muscle aging preclinically and uh, we have seen them in uh, also in a primary my, uh, uh, muscle cells from healthy uh, humans, healthy elderly humans or inclusion body myositis, which is mm. a disease characterized by protein aggregates within the muscle, which is also associated to impaired overall health and quality of life and muscle health, but is not necessarily considered sarcopenia. So it's probably measured clinically by different readouts and it has this as a biomarker, people really use this uh, protein aggregations. Uh, but in sarcopenia per se, um, I believe it would be probably the case, but it would require uh, some validation there. Yeah. Right. Now, you you did in vivo uh, or somebody, it, it, a, an in vivo study has been done with uh, like NAD precursors, which have shown reduced, uh, I guess, protein aggregation in muscles, right. in, in mice. Right. Is that correct? That so, was yeah, so that's one of my studies. Uh, yes, was that, was, study. uh, that was one of our studies in Seri Ports in 2021. So what we observed to perhaps, I'm not sure if I should say to our surprise, because we know that proteostasis collapses in aging. But the fact that we would, able, we would be able to look at different, you know, muscles in mice, and then also even things like simpler models like C. elegans and even primary muscle cells from taken up from muscles from young or uh, healthy elderly. And then we would uh, look at particularly amyloid formation. So one particular part of the proteostasis collapse, we really observed a strong enrichment for these uh, amyloid seeds within mm -hmm. or oligomeric structures within the cells, right? So within the muscle mm -hmm. cells. And so that was kind of surprising to us because it really compares or seems to compare to some extent to what people would establish for uh, diseases like inclusion body myositis. So we did a little bit of this comparison and then we saw that indeed, preclinically speaking at least, the use of NAD precursors may ameliorate the formation of these aggregates or, the, or may improve the clearance. But uh, clinically speaking, we haven't, there is no study that is looking at this yet. Right. So just out of interest, you were using NR, what kind of dose with the mice? Oh, so with the mice, yes. Yeah. So normally we use about 400, uh, for chronic studies, we use about 400 milligrams per kilogram per day. So we wow. put it just in the cho diet of the mice. So the mice actually feed on their food pellets and they take mm -hmm. up NR. 
we have done this also i think many people have done that for uh, we use always the same range i mean people have also put it in the drinking water that mm -hmm. seems to work as well yeah. uh, and that's true also for nnm for nam i mean people either put it in usually in drinking water or gavage it's another mm -hmm. way to do intragastric administration or you put it in the food pellets but the range is always between anything between 400 milligram per kilogram per day to as low as perhaps if you gavage where you get one direct bolus of the compound as let's say one or five milligram per kilogram in mice uh, so we have done this also for our, all our studies with NAD precursors uh, yeah yeah 400 is towards the top end yeah so that in humans yeah to give a bit of translational insight mm -hmm. i mean that to humans would correspond to yeah almost or, or quite close to about almost two grams uh, per kilogram in a human so that would mean mm. uh kind of very high dosage because in that sense uh for humans i mean in our uh, all the uh ua all these supplements that have been approved as from the grass that have the grass status usually they are considered uh up to one gram uh, mm. per kilogram uh, in a, or, or one gram per day in humans. Mm. Uh, but actually for disease conditions or age associated conditions, so there are some trials that are starting to go with higher doses of NR list or, uh, or other established precursors, because that seems to bring the best efficacy. So maybe in conditions where you are really physically impaired, you, you may as well take a little <laughs> bit the risk and try to to get something meaningful in terms of clinical efficacy. And this, of course, needs to be then tailored and leveled for healthy elderly uh, or even mm -hmm. for people that are healthy but just want to supplement for increased performance and so on. And here also comes a lot. Uh, what would be very, very important would be, of course, uh, you know, pre precision. So personalization of these supplementation strategies, mm -hmm. which people are studying. I mean, also at NUS, uh, people are very the work of Andrea Meyer. She's very interested in getting to a point where we can optimize supplementation for people uh, already uh, even if they are just uh, LT seniors or or LT overall uh, but that would be also something that needs to be understood and it will take some time in order to understand whether this could actually improve the clinical efficacy in the long run yes the whole precision medicine thing would be a very interesting topic to, to dive into uh, I, I don't suppose you have like sedentary mice and mice that exercise I mean, do you know whether exercise will help reduce the protein buildup in oh, muscle cells? Um, well, I think that would certainly be, I don't know if there are studies specifically looking at how exercise would uh, improve protein aggregation. We Certainly we know that exercise has been linked even to improvement of neurodegeneration. So to the, to the, uh, to the, in rodents at least, I mean, and even in uh, elder, in uh, people which have dementia, I mean, right. usually they recommend exercise because essentially you improve bioenergetics at the systemic mm -hmm. level and the muscles also can essentially stimulate, I mean, the production of uh, exerkines, so molecules that can have uh, systemic benefits and even stimulate the brain to actually generate mm -hmm. new neurons even. So yeah. through essentially um, signaling pathways that are activated following exercise. Now, whether there is a in muscle that leads to specific removal of aggregates, we do not know yet i mean or at least i've not run these studies mm. but i would not be surprised if that's the case because then essentially you put back in place the wall balance between the need for muscle to generate new proteins to maintain muscle mass and the uh, and you're generating also more essentially forcing mitochondria to generate more energy in order to mm. support the muscle exercise so that would probably kind of reactivate the wall of aesthetic process right yeah i mean so lifestyle is always a good way to to exactly. address these things uh, if at all possible